This is an unrehearsed program. The views expressed are those of the guests and not necessarily those of the producer. Today's topic. The Nuclear Deal in Award Winner Program Passion for Truth. Welcome to another edition of Passion for Truth. The Bush administration has come under heavy criticism for signing a major nuclear deal with India, which has expressed support for Iran's nuclear energy program. Are there serious consequences of a full nuclear cooperation with India, or has India surprised the U.S.? with its smart diplomatic moves to help avoid an international chaos. All next with our panelist, Chuck Woolbury, formerly from the World Federalist Association. The objective of the World Federalist Association is to strengthen the UN. Dr. Abul Hassan Ansari, a researcher on perspect historical perspectives of Indian events impacting on Muslims in India and abroad, Nina Bhagat, staff attorney from the Jubilee Campaign International, and Dr. Amarjit Singh, Director of Voices for Freedom, also a columnist for several newspapers. We also invited the representative from the Indian Embassy, uh, but uh, he declined the invitation. Um, let's uh, move on. Um, uh, Chuck, did we, is India supporting Iran's nuclear program? Well, uh, it depends on which day you ask. So, uh, they go back and forth. Uh, I, I really don't know what uh, uh, their current position is, but I, I would like to bring a bigger issue here is that, that uh, the whole issue of uh, non proliferation and disarmament, I think, is, is uh, in the future going to become a dead issue in that uh, because of the dual use nature of technology. And you already see this with the uh, ability to try to um, help some countries with their nuclear power for energy reasons, but they can also use that same um, nuclear power for weaponry. Did we ignore, Dr. Ansari, a nuclear qualification issues facing America in negotiating a, a nuclear treaty with India? Oh, absolutely. I think what the U.S. has done such is a dubious policy. You should have a one standard. Here, we see your friends, and there is no problem. You can do whatever you want to do. For example, Israel has created a lot of random bombs. We don't even talk about it. Since the expansion of China, and China will be a major threat to the United States, not the Soviet Union or anything, any other country. America has recognized that uh, they need to have a bulwark against China, so they are tilting more towards India. On the other hand, they are putting a pressure on Iran not to develop the bomb, not to develop the nuclear energy. I don't understand this. And we should have one standard, and this gives the wrong message, especially when we went to Iraq and uh, saw the weapons of mass destruction, which we knew that we, they did not have it. They're trying to do the same thing to North Korea, and he said, we are going to let other Iraq happen. So they are pursuing their own goals. Uh, to have the non proliferation United States, which is taking a leading role, must have one standard policy, which is lacking. And that is why, as you said, that this is going to be a dead issue in the near future. Nina, did we, um, was it a bad diplomacy when India expressed support for Iran's nuclear uh, energy program? Um, especially when the uh, United States was drumming up support uh, for international pressure on Iran. I think it's hard to characterize whether it was back, bad diplomacy <laughs> for the Indian government, because as Chuck said, there's such an inconsistency on where they actually stand regarding Iran and its, its nuclear program. So in order to characterize it as being bad or, or um, improper diplomacy, I'm not sure it's fair to do that. What has to happen is, is India has to be held accountable for its last and final stand and put put pressure on it to make a final stand regarding Ur the Irani program and where whether they agree with it, support it, or, or stand against it. India has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. I mean, is that a big problem now in the state of Iran? No, I think we we'll have to look at the whole scenario. Firstly, India has not signed NPP. Pakistan has maintained always its consistent position that when India will sign NPT, it will sign. In 1998, India was the first one who declared or who had in the Pokhran backyard of Punjab its five nuclear explosions. And actually before that, in 1974, when India had its first atomic explosion, it said, oh, it's for peaceful purposes. And during all these years, India was building its uh, nuclear bomb, and finally in 1998 they did it. And then two weeks later, Pakistan followed suit. 
Now the question comes, American policy and Indian policy. Unfortunately, with the present American administration, the moment they started showing their back to the international treaties, I think even the groundwork for this NPT was also laid. And India, now look at India's standard. On one hand, it, this itself has not signed NPT. On the other hand, while uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh came to the United States on July 19th, uh, signed a, a deal with President Bush that uh, America will help India in its uh, peaceful uh, nuclear program. Then, when he went back, India's foreign minister went to Iran and signed a $6 billion, or discussed the final stages about $6 billion gas pipeline deal uh, passing to Pakistan. Then, in America, as the congressman who was supporting India, particularly Gary Ackerman, uh, chairman of the India caucus, and Tom Lantos, congressman, they got upset that what India is up to. On one hand, you are telling the United States, oh, give us exception from that and help us in building our nuclear program. On the other hand, International Atomic Agency, which is calling Iran on this issue, uh, and the United States is supporting that move, India is turning around and signing uh, with siding with Iran. And then that was the time that immediately after that, American congressmen in the Inter House International Relations Committee and all started saying, now, India will have to choose. And when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh came in September, when UN General Assembly session opened, then Bush actually summoned him and said, be straight where you are. But I doubt that come November, when there will be a final vote on this issue, India may again have a vote face. I think U.S. Congress will hold that granting some concession to India until November. They will watch for India's vote on Iran issue. And India may be trying to run with the hair in front of the house. Is, Chuck, uh, is, Chuck, Chuck, is India wrong in closing up to Iran, even though Iran is, uh, uh, Iran, uh, Iran is a major supplier of energy? I mean, the pipeline project that we are talking about costs billions and billions. Yeah, of course they're wrong. They have their interests, their energy interests. Each nation has its own interests. But is India wrong in closing up to Iran uh, in a backhanded way? No, no, I think the problem here is the assumption that we will achieve some kind of peace and security by trying to disarm the country. I mean, if you look at Iraq, we made that mistake once, and if we try to make that mistake again with Korea or with Pakistan or with India, it's going to be a mess. The idea is that peace and security does not come through disarmament. Uh, if you doubt that, look at Rwanda. I think but for India to turn around after making a deal with the U.S., with Iran, was it a was it a something doing something behind the scenes, uh, Dr. Musari? No, this deal has been going on for a long time. In fact, Pakistan was the man of stick. Whatever this pipeline could have been built a long time ago. If you look into that, let's go about 10, 15, 20 years ago when India was in the Soviet orbit and we were working against India. Now, you think America has a law for India? No. I mean, they have looking their own interests to contain the China. Now, again, India is looking its own benefits with Iran, which America or any other country cannot supply it and cannot do it. So I think what they are doing is the right thing. I mean, if I were the Prime Minister of India, I will dictate the policy that benefits my country and my people, not any third, third, third country, regardless of who they are and what they are. Now, if the United States to look into it, why you are supporting India today? You were against India before. So in, 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 in this political arena, there are no permanent foes or, or, or friends. So what India is doing is the right thing. They are looking at the interests of their own people. And I think that will benefit them more than the this American deal. And American deal is not because they have love for India or Manmohan Singh or Bajpai. They are looking at their own interests. So every country does it. It's nothing unusual, nothing wrong. But if I were the Prime Minister of India, I will do what I think is the best for my country and my people. Should we worry about making a nuclear deal with countries like Iran, Syria, India, Pakistan, knowing the kind of government they have, the way they treat their people, the threat they pose on the nuclear issue, the stalling that they have done on this issue. We'll ask our panelists next. Stay with us. Passion for truth. We should be worried about making a nuclear deal with such countries, uh, uh, Jack. Well, I, I don't think we can make nuclear deals with countries that, uh, where there's no real enforcement capabilities in the world. Um, the, the, the kind of the, the dark news is that uh, even if we had a way to completely control the spread of nuclear technology and we could enforce it, there's still other technologies that are far more devastating, far more cheaper, far more easy to distribute. That uh, this, this focus on nuclear technology and concern, I think, is really missing the key point. And what we want in the world is security. 
and that, uh, you know, to arm every nation, I mean, they're certainly not going to make us safer, but also to try to disarm some nations while others remain armed with nuclear nations is still not going to make us safer. I think there also has to be another issue to address is an issue of humanitarian rights. I mean, here you have countries like what, what I'm sure the American policy is, and anybody in the international community, you don't want another Chernobyl to happen. You don't want to have countries who have rushed to build these nuclear capabilities have some kind of um, environmental or health um, atrocity that happens. So I think it's in the interest of both countries to engage in this dip diplomatic deal or agreement or relationship in order to ensure that hopefully American technology and American capabilities can help stabilize a country like this and lead them to the right ways without having a Chernobyl happen or some kind of major nuclear malfunction that causes millions of, of deaths. Well, first of all, Chernobyl was not built by a third world country, it was built by the Soviet Union. <laughs> and second thing is that what I, I, I personally feel that uh, when Pakistan was developing the bomb, everybody was afraid. Now they have the bomb, it has provided the stability to their country, to their region. Otherwise, India was ready to go uh, attack Pakistan when they exploded the, you know, the, the back off. Nuclear arms are more to prevent the war and not to fight the war because there are not going to be any winners. So if other countries are going to develop nuclear bomb, I think when they have the bomb, they will come to their senses, they will become more stable. And the technology is such, the knowledge is such, there is not one country which has a monopoly on the nuclear energy or nuclear technology. It's something that, you know, you can go and build the bomb if you, you have enough resources. So other countries are, especially the Iran, they want to have a nuclear power. They said repeatedly that we don't want to build the bomb, we just want the nuclear power so that they can supply the energy to their own people, and that will lead to the prosperity of the nation and more stable government. I think we should support the idea of building the nuclear power plant, not necessarily for military use. But every in history shows that every country who engages in this reasoning of we need to develop energy, a domestic nuclear power, you cannot differentiate between nuclear power used domestically yeah. and nuclear power that will be turned into nuclear weapons. But and that's the problem. This is what Iran is justifying its production. Well, we have a lot of bombs. Uh, don't we have a lot of bombs? Why, why don't we use some standard for other countries? Why only Iran? And we are singling out Iran because of whatever is the reason, whether the government... Okay, the British, uh, Dr. Sorry, the British uh, officials have evidence that Iran may have supplied sophisticated bombs to insurgents in Iraq. So what? And technology from the bomb I mean, from Iran. That's what we have been doing. We supplied to Afghanistan and Mujahideen to break down the uh, Soviet Union. So it's uh, like your enemy's enemy is my friend. It's like this. I think what we need to do, we need to, rather than treating and uh, uh, declaring the military options and all that kind of nonsense, we need to have a peaceful dialogue with any country that we disagree. Okay, okay. you think, uh, Dr. Amarjit Singh, India, India's argument that uh, when it talks about uh, refusing to vote on the, uh, refer the matter to the Security Council, it said it needed more time and space uh, for Iran, otherwise there would be a big international confrontation and chaos. You think it made a smart move uh, by not referring, um, by not agreeing to refer the matter to the Security Council because it would have been a major setback for Iran. I think firstly they are trying to cheat themselves. Who is trying that, to that, cheat? That, India. India is trying to cheat itself. Uh, firstly, when we look at the vote pattern in September 24, uh, 35 members of Guardians, as they are called, met in Vienna, Austria, had a vote. 22 members voted for bringing Iran uh, to a uh, UN Security Council. Uh, Twelve were absentees, amongst them was Russia, China, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Sri Lanka, and one, uh, Venezuela, voted against it. Now, India's stand. India has been so inconsistent with all that, that even in that discussion while it was going on, on one hand it was selling this idea to the others, oh, they are helping to get Iran some more time for negotiation and all, but the resolution is very clear. And even this vote on September 24 was uncalled for. They hastened that meeting. They were, this meeting was not on schedule. They were to meet in November. But the basic purpose was to put pressure on Iran. And I think India, though it may be thinking, as Dr. Sari said, that it was in their national interest, I think it ruined its case, not only in the United States uh, about that, but even, look, 5 to 10 percent of Indian oil is coming from Iran. Its energy needs are increasing. And if we in America think uh, that uh, we are trying to call with China, China has already a blank check for Iran that whatever energy it has, it is ready to consume. I think in the end, India will be in a position that neither it will be able to justify to the U.S. lawmakers 
that why uh, it wants its nuclear exemption from NPT and others concession. On the other hand, it will uh, have its uh, relationship with Iran in a very bad shape. Uh, oh, Mina, the open-ended nature of the resolution that he's talking about uh, gives you the impression there will be another round of diplomacy in Vienna before the dispute is referred to the Security Council and India could change its position any time. I guess I guess this is the nature you have with diplomacy and politics, that every country and every new government that takes over that country can hold a different policy, I mean, and, and can maintain a different policy. The inconsistency that it, India has had in, in the past may indicate that might happen, that they may have future interests with Iran that are more profitable to them, and certainly they have the right to do that. But once you become a nuclear co country and you've entered a globalized community, you are held to a higher standard. You're held to a higher standard within that community. Community. So if India wants to be a big player in the globalized community, they have to be able to stay consistent on their nuclear policies with other countries and be held accountable to those policies and their consistency. And I think one point which I think is very relevant in this discussion is about the Israel's uh, role. Yes, I mean, well, President Musharraf <clears throat> addressed uh, in annual session of American Jewish Congress in New York on September 17th, got his standing ovation. And now the pro-Israel lobby in U.S. Congress and all, which at one time was totally hostile to Pakistan, and India was using that to the hilt for their own PR thing and all, has turned around. And actually, during the earthquake, President Musharraf called uh, Mr. Jack, I think is his name, who is the chairperson of the American Jewish Congress, uh, to ask for help. That, and this is for the first time that after Turkey, with whom uh, Israel had very friendly relations, it will be Pakistan. So I think it won't be easy for India now even to get that concession, uh, which they got in the July 19th agreement between Bush and Manmohan Singh uh, during the hearings in the American Congress. This has been um, Mina outmaneuvered by Iran and India in their efforts to bring the issue to the Security Council. I'm not sure if it's been outmaneuvered. Everybody looks at it as the U.S.'s um, intent or initiative to do this. And we're talking about a globalized community. We're talking about a European push right now more than anything else to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons. I mean, so there are other interests involved. So I'm not sure if it's the U the U.S. that's been outmaneuvered, but it's the whole international community now that has to be held accountable for not putting the pressure. And to have India involved, I think, when you, re when you refer to it as a game, it is a game, but it's a high-stakes game, and they're putting a lot on this. From a humanitarian effort, from energy, domestic energy production effort, these are a lot of things that they're gambling away if they turn and decide to side with Iran. Iran is a very unstable country, a country that you cannot depend on in the long-term future. So for India to be a world player in the globalized community and for them to take that gamble and play this game, they might see the negative effect maybe 5, 10, or 15 years from now, which is something that they have to have the foresight when deciding. One time during the, Czech, the, during the Cold War, um, Washington expected India to stand up to the Soviet Union, and the uh, U.S. was uh, regularly disappointed <coughs> because India would not stand up to the Soviet Union. When you're talking about game, we are take, we're talking about the, uh, the external and internal positions which do not which collide. You know, we're actually talking about war. We're, we're talking about a, a, a condition of relationships between nations in which there is no there is no rules. And, and you know, one country is going to look out for itself, and the United States can make all the demands it wants, and it has the power sometimes to, to enforce its demands. Other nations don't. That's why they seek nuclear weapons, so they don't get enforced. Well, the European alliance, European sovereignty uh, on the table. But the United States threatens the military. Actually, if you look into the former chancellor of Germany, he says that take uh, this military option off the table, then we are with you. Otherwise, we are not with you. I mean, you cannot bring, you cannot solve all the problem by using the military power, no matter how powerful you are. We had learned a lesson in Vietnam. We forgot. I think we are going to learn in, in Iraq. Uh, attacking or invading Iran is an easy thing, but it will be worst nightmare for the United States. So I think what we can do here. Sit down on the table, and work with the union, our partners, and they are working. Military option is not first over there. And military option is not even considered at all. I think we can talk to them peacefully on a, on a peace table and have a diplomatic solution, which is always better than a military solution. I think India's track record during the Cold War era, though India claimed that it is the leader of the non aligned movement, and at that time, Colonel Nasser of Egypt and 
Marshal Tito. Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia and Nehru of India, they were called as a punitive under the normal animal movement. But the fact of the matter is that India has voted more times against the United States than actually Soviet Union itself. India supported Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, and it has been consistent in the uh, Soviet orbit. Now, in the 1990s, as the situation changed and collapse of Soviet Union and all, and India was looking for uh, some sucker from the best, uh, West, and eventually Americans gave them an olive branch to hold on, and which led until this, until this uh, June 19th agreement. But fact of the matter is, again, India will be ultimately in the Russian orbit from a gun in the hands of an Indian soldier to a screw in an Indian factory. Everything is Russian-made. They have to depend on that. And ultimately, whatever Russians decide, India will have to. It's a short-term sort of one lobby here in the United States, which they think that they can use India against China. But I think that's not a big argument. China in itself is a power, and the United States is dealing with it directly. But India, either sometimes with the hair or sometimes with the uh, tortoise, is showing its shallowness, that how shallow it was during the Cold War era, and now in the changed world, how shallow again its uh, diplomacy, its foreign policy, and its commitments to non-violence and Gandhian philosophy and all, all such things are. But, Meena, during the Cold War, speaking of Cold War, India professed a non-aligned uh, status. But some in Washington saw it as a satellite of Moscow. India was never non-aligned. India was always aligned with the Soviet Union. Never was non-aligned, although on the paper it says a non-aligned uh, moment by Tito, Marshall, uh, Marshall Tito, uh, Jamal Nasser, and Nehru. India was never a non-aligned country. Well, I mean, in the Cold War, you had a race for arms. You had two countries racing to build as much as possible, as fast as possible. And any of the neighboring countries, they were under that umbrella of protection. So I, I think India had a full right to uh, to stay outside of the politics or try to stay at least aligned with their neighbors, because at that point, you side with the, the closest power to you, um, geographically speaking. I mean, when we talk about a globalized community, we're talking about, as you mentioned, yes, there are Russian-made equipment and Russian-made products in India, but when you're in a globalized community, there is economic trade, there's environmental issues, there is military issues that all have to be taken care of. But now we live in a world where diplomacy is the only way to strike those deals. As America and the European Union and different countries try to negotiate with Iran, they're not asking them just to stop building nuclear weapons, but they are offering them alternatives that we will produce energy for you or we will provide energy or meet your needs. This is what has to be offered. This is what was offered to India as well, a, a, a domestic energy policy with America in order to produce their needs, an alternative to dealing with Iran. Well, when the first uh, uh, heavy water plant was built in Shumbi, I think, by Canada, it was all for the peaceful purposes from where that they stole all the uh, nuclear material and they had an explosion in May of 1974. When the India exploded the bomb, everybody was surprised how India could do that. So the question here is, even if you are producing the energy for them, I, I think it's very easy, easy to cheat. Yeah. I think the best thing is to have a friendly relationship and talk in an open, open society, Speaking open manner. Strong recently elected president said that Iran has a right to produce nuclear fuel for civilian use, the terror unleashed by the U.S. occupation of Iraq, and the threatening nature of the U.S. and some European powers that wanted to make the U.N. Security Council a tool of aggression. Under such circumstances, would you recommend having any kind of um, nuclear dealings with Iran, Dr. Mujici? No, I think the one point which Dr. Ansari was trying to make that certainly when we talk about UN Security Council and the way sometimes we push the issues, and Iraq in itself uh, is an example, that may not be the wiser thing. But on the other hand, now uh, look at the Iranian president's speech in front of UN General Assembly. What did he say? So while he's opening his country for anybody who needs that help, we can't say that this is nuclear reactor for peaceful purposes, this is for other purposes. Similarly, in India-Pakistan case, we as Sikhs, we always have this position that they both countries should be defanged. We are for a nuclear-free South Asia. And already, as there is tensions, they have fought wars, and one another country in our neighborhood, Iran coming up with that nuclear thing, and that will create uh, more confusion and more danger for them. That's so right. our, our position is consistent on that, as far as the 25 million Sikh position goes. Well, one final thought from each of our panelists. India is emerging from its non-aligned status and becoming a global power. 
Do you think it must continually think about making the smart and diplomatic choice, even if it means rejecting Iran, starting with you, um, Chuck? Yeah, I think all nations want peace and security. And again, peace and security is not a function of armament or disarmament. It's a function of, of law and of protecting human rights. And until we get that issue resolved, this nuclear issue is just a distraction. I think we should have one standard. We have a double standard when it comes to deal with India and Israel and other countries. We are pushing too much pressure on Iran and other countries not to deal with nuclear bomb, which is not going to happen. I mean, they are they will come up with a bomb, not only Iran, but other, other countries. There will be many, many countries which will come up with a nuclear bomb. I think the solution is in the peaceful coexistence. And you mentioned about the South Asia being nuclear-free zone. I really want the entire globe to be in nuclear-free zone. Are we willing to listen to them and do what we're telling others? Unless we do that, I think we are making a futile attempt to contain the other countries to make a nuclear bomb or nuclear energy. I think the starting point has to be transparency and accountability. With every country you deal with, no matter their different policies and their different um, their different issues that they, they bring to the table, you have to demand that there is some kind of transparency, that their country is opening to showing what they're undertaking, and accountability. Accountability for what type of law, what type of government is going to be able to control whatever they finally end up producing. I think U.S. lawmakers on the hearing on this July 19th deal need to give a message to India that they can't have the cake and eat it too, as India's track record on human rights, it's all sort of its bad relationship with its neighbors, and even its involvement in Iran, uh, as we know about Dr. Abdul Kalam's, uh, Pakistan's Abdul Kalam having uh, helped in uh, Libya or Iran, but on the other hand, we forgot that Dr. Prasad, who was one time the head of the Indian Atomic Energy Commission, has been barred by the State Department last year from entering the United States for the reason that he was helping Iran. So whatever India's policy on Iran had been, I think now this is the time to unmask it, and it will be firstly U.S. Congress hearing, then it will be November vote, which will show the true face of India. And that's all the time we have. He brings you another edition of Passion for Truth next Saturday and Sunday. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all. If you have any question, comment, or suggestion on this program, please send us an email at mshower.hotmail.com or write to us at 1011 Sard Meadow Lane, McLean, Virginia, 22101. Please watch GTV programs every week at the same station and at the same time and send your comments to mshower.hotmail.com. <laughs>